I'm Kelly Alsip. I'm a horticulture educator based out of Bloomington. And um, I, when I do my research, sometimes I'm a little dumbfounded at uh, what I find. And sometimes I get super inspired and change the way I think about gardening. And I wanted to talk about um, a book I read. It's called The No Maintenance Perennial Garden, and it's by Roy Diblick. I actually think a master gardener might have told me to read this book, and I'm very happy they did. And so, he, like I said, he kind of made me rethink about gardening and gardening with perennials in general. And so he's a plants man. He's from Northwind Perennial Farms, and he's famous for his gardens at Shedd Aquarium, the Art Institute, and Millennium Park. So many of you have probably seen some of his gardens before. And then he shares in this kind of perennial garden theory with Pete Odoff. And he is famous for, he's from the Netherlands, and he is famous for Lurie Garden. And then he's also famous for plantings he did in New York City along the High Line. So they really focus on perennial garden in an urban park setting. And so some of the things, they bring up new ideas that make you think about how you are gardening with your perennials. And so what is this theory that Roy Diblick is really trying to propose? It has uh, multiple points. And so I know there's a lot of words on my slides, but I really wanted to promote ideas. Um, the new perennial m movement, what he's trying to get you to understand is that if if you plant um, these individual perennials in communities and then he has these combinations of plants that he has put together and at the end of the book there's these layouts of different gardens that he proposes and he tells you exactly how many of each plant to put in and so what he's proposing is that if you put the plants in in these combinations then and follow some of the gardening ideas that by year three you'll have such minimal input into maintaining this garden because the plants grow in these intertwining communities so he wants you to get to know the plant beyond the color, the bloom time, and the height. Like really understand how that plant uh, responds to the soil, to how it grows, to its even its seasonal interest. And he actually proposes that every gardener should learn 30 plants really well. Um, you probably already have some of those plants in your back pocket, but do you know 30 really well? Um, and then you can use those in different combinations throughout your entire garden space. So we must have the ability <clears throat> to care for our gardens. I... I commend master gardeners when they bring me these complicated landscape designs for them really putting the effort into trying to understand the plants and, tr and, and trying to, you know, pick plants that go with the themes of their gardens. But sometimes I don't know if they are thinking about the maintenance aspect of it. And, you know, as master volunteers, you know, I know we have some forever gardens, but sometimes we install a garden and then maintain it for a while and then step back and uh, allow you know the partners to start taking care of that garden 
And by using this Roy Diblick theory and his perennial garden designs, you're kind of enabling these projects to take over these perennial gardens easily because there's not a lot of input. Uh, you truly need to understand your weed nemesis. Um, you know, who, who are the big ones? Who's the ones that um, are going to cause problems in the future? And which ones are not as, um, not have to worry about quite so much? So he closely plants these communities together, and at, by the third year, these plants have knit together, so you have this beautiful landscape, and it really makes weeding quite easy because you're blocking the sun from these germinating weed seeds. Um, plus, you're you know really attacking your weed nemesis, so you're not going to have as many weed seeds. So like I said, he said, come to know 30 plants intimately. And you have to ask yourself, do you really know 30 plants intimately? How long have you been growing coneflower? Do you know it intimately? Do you know how it works in the soil, how it acts with other plants? He also, in the book, asks why we do certain things. And once we once I say this, you guys are going to be like, yeah, why do we do this? Um... And it just makes you think about what we are taught about gardening and, you know, some of those older traditions we may not value anymore. For instance, when you start a garden bed, do you always till the soil? Why are you tilling the soil? Because you think the soil is bad? Because you want this, the plant roots to expand faster? Is it really necessary to till a garden bed before you plant? Um, when you're tilling, you're bringing up many weed seeds, which is potent more um, problems in the future. So this, you know, I know we always till our vegetable beds, but why do we have to till our soil before we put in perennials? And why do we incorporate organic matter without truly knowing what's in the soil? I do this all the time. You know, again, this is not, I'm not going to, we're, I'm not going to compare perennial gardening to vegetable gardening, but vegetable garden requires a lot more input than perennial garden. But you think you're incorporating organic matter to improve um, nutrient uptake, to improve the soil tilth. But what really is the organic matter doing for you? And he focuses on particular perennials that don't really need a lot of organic matter for them to thrive. Why do we space plants so far apart? You guys know this. I know many master gardeners are trying to find space for their plants, but sometimes when you go up to a urban landscape, you see, you know, plants that are six feet apart, and it's like you're just going to have a maintenance nightmare rather than if you planted those plants one foot apart and had a nice grouping of plants. And the wood chip wasteland, I, I thought this was a great thing because in those gardens, those landscapes that you see where there's plants that are spaced really far apart, it's like there's this plant and a whole bunch of mulch and a plant and a whole bunch of mulch. We're not trying to grow mulch. I meant mulch is supposed to help conserve moisture, but um, rather than planting more plants, you just put down wood chips. So why do we think that this is the appropriate way to landscape? I don't know about you, but I'd much rather see flowers than mulch. And then this is something that I think many gardeners are starting to reconsider how they do things at the end of the growing season, just for pollinator and beneficial insect and wildlife habitat. Um, don't cut back everything at the end of the growing season. Um, like I said, it 
It gives habitat to some of the that wildlife in your garden. Um, it protects the plants um, from you know winter kill and um, uh, frost um, from the frost the frost killing the the crown of the plant and um, you so you wait until spring to cut back your plants. Plus, not to mention. I, I guess everybody wants to see a nice clean landscape in the fall, but personally, um, looking at the beauty of a winter garden can be sometimes just as with the textures, just as pretty as when it's in the growing season. And then we do improper watering. We um, tend to not water quite as efficiently and then we fertilize on a regimen. Um, if your perennials aren't showing signs of nutrient deficiencies, then you probably don't have to fertilize them. It, same with trees in Illinois. Unless you see some sort of deficiency, you, you, you probably have enough of the nutrients available in the soil to where you don't have to fertilize. And we use pre-emergent herbicides rather than putting chemicals on the earth rather than, you know, um, attacking the weeds, having a plan. And then I always love saying this, but weeds heal the earth. Um, I, um, if anybody's ever talked to me, I um, I gush over a scientist from the University of Illinois. Her name is Mae Berenbaum, and she did a lot of research on the honeybee colony collapse disorder. And I read a bunch of her papers, and I went up to her and I said, "I know what you're trying. I know what your message is. Um, you're trying to to tell us that weeds are actually good." for the environment and she was like you're right they are because they're providing flowers um, some weeds are really good and provide sources of food for larvae um, they're giving those bees um, nutrition when they're already stressed out so why we hate every weed personally i'm a selective weeder um, i'll go after the big weeds, the ones that I know are going to be prolific and be bad, and then I'll keep stuff like the violets and the um, uh, dandelions, and I'll just deadhead those dandelions, but weeds actually don't have to necessarily be bad. So why do you think your soil is bad? What, it, what we're, we're saying is if you have a space and there's grass growing in it, what if grass is growing in it, it's probably pretty good soil. Um, so what makes you think that that soil is bad? What makes you think that you have to till it or add organic matter or um, rather than just plant in the soil you have? So there are some benefits to no-till. I'm loving this no-till idea because I hate weeding. Um, I don't want to bring up the weeds, but they it pres preserves the soil structure. Um, if you ever go to a garden that's been tilled every year, it's going to have like this uh, pan nine inches down. It's going to be, you know, so much, it, it's going to ha have problems with water. It's going to have problems with the whole structure of the soil. So, you know, we know farmers are doing no-till for many reasons of in, in improving the soil structure so they don't have runoff. So why do we feel like we have to till? It doesn't bring up the weed seeds. This is my favorite part. Oh, there's nothing like planting a vegetable garden and um, then just constantly weeding the entire summer. I'm personally experimenting with a vegetable garden this year where we are not tilling. Uh, we're just planting directly into the ground and we are um, hoping that we have less weed pressures. Um, you actually increase your water holding capacity in the soil by not tilling. Um, you, uh, 
you have uh, those pores that allow the water to be held and then when you till, you actually remove those. You increase the variety of life in your soil. Why do you care about the variety of life in your soil? Well, there's microbes living in there, there's beneficial um, insects, there's my mycorrhizae, fungal pathogens. All of this stuff is contributing to a living organism that is your soil. Um, you actually decrease the impact of drought by not tilling. Uh, again, with the water holding capacity, you increase soil fertility because you're not having runoff um, and uh, it makes more available to the plant. You, you actually prevent air and water pollution. Um, again, you know, it's due to that runoff, you'd much rather have plants that hold the water into the soil rather than, you know, um, places where the water can run off and it actually allows the soil to act as a sink for carbon. Now this is a big one, especially for those of you that are, you know, thinking about climate change, um, planting trees, um, planting prairies to combat climate change. Well, one of the things that you want to also think about is Tree roots, plant roots, the soil actually acts as a sink for carbon. And when you till it, you prevent it from acting as a sink. Organic matter. So you, the, the, the bad part about, the good part about organic matter is it increases the soil tilt, makes the roots grow. When the roots are grow and are happy, it actually makes the top plant grow, but you want them to, uh, you know, you we're not picking out perennials that are difficult to grow and need, um, you know, all that advantage. We're picking out plants that are tough and can pick, can live just fine in the soil you have. So when you add organic matter, you actually promote some soil disease issues. Um, and the same with mulch, you know, you keep that water up close to the plant roots, then it's going to um, maybe get too wet and then promote soil diseases. Plants grow fast. I've had um, pollinator gardens where other people have taken care of them and they fertilize these plants and add organic matter and then they're, they, that's why they look weedy because they're, they grow so fast and leggy, you, you would rather have more substantial growth and it looks good. Um, yeah, organic matter contributes to weeds, um, especially uh, organic matter especially contributes to chickweed and henbit. So if you know you have those um, weeds, then you um, might have, you know, a lot of organic matter in your soil. Um, most perennials actually do well in or low organic rich soils. I've been reading a lot of soil tests lately in my area and you know what's the normal organic matter in a soil test is about one to two percent and that's pretty good. You know they wouldn't if you had a organic uh, reading of one to two percent, it wouldn't necessarily mean you'd have to add organic matter. But the ones that I have been reading lately are around five to ten percent. And that's a little too high. I mean, you can have too much of a good thing. Um, so if these perennials do not need that organic matter and organic matter can cause issues, why add it? Um, so how is organic matter um, contributed in a um, Roy Diblick style garden? Um, you don't ever remove the decaying leaves. You, um, you, in the spring before the bulbs appear, you actually mow over your garden and allow that organic, uh, that the organic matter of the leaves um, go back to the soil and act as a mulch. If you can't mow it, which sometimes 
uh, you know, like ornamental grasses, you'd never be able to mow that. Then you actually trim the stems, but you don't put the stems and the, the dead stuff in a compost bin. You actually mulch it up a little bit and put it directly back into the landscape. So here are some steps to installing a bed. So you can clear the site with cardboard, newspaper, black plastic. We know these are organic options, but um, it takes a long time, especially in the area we live in. And we don't have the really, really hot sun um, that lower states may have that may you know utilize that black plastic to um, heat up those underneath it. So uh, when it comes to clearing your site, cardboard and black plastic may be a longer commitment. If you use glyphosate, you have to use it two times. So you have to come in and use the glyphosate first and then come back seven to ten days later and kill whatever has either not been killed or germinated. The very beginning this is the only time you'll ever add a soil amendment you're going to cover that area with two inches of leaf compost and then you water deeply so you're going to water deeply so that you get that compost to get that soil uh, leaf compost to go into the soil so you're going to use a tile spade to plant he had he had, he had like you guys he had his favorite tools and um, really sold them so they were uh, a tile plant a spade uh, I like this one I have a root slayer personally um, and then he says watering is critical in the first eight weeks you're gonna do one inch every four to six days now you guys as gardeners or master naturalists know that in the beginning when you first plant you want to give it a little bit more water um, but then you want to back off a little bit so that its roots actually start mining the soil. So by the third season, you're actually going to transition from the nurturing stage to the establishing stage. And as long as you have five inches of water in the month of June, July, and August, which sometimes we do not, you don't have to do supplemental watering just because you put it on a weekly schedule. Now, I like drip irrigation personally, especially when it comes to vegetable gardening, but he doesn't like the drip irrigation because that's not, we don't set our perennial plants up in a line the way we do vegetables. And so you're inconsistently watering the ground. He actually likes using sprinklers on tripod, tripods. And then he emphasizes rain gauges. I mean, every gardener should have a rain gauge to be able to go, how much rain did I get and how much rain should I, should I do to water today? Just because, you know, the top inch of the soil looks a little dry doesn't mean you it's, it's time to water. Um, so you can't wrap your, so again, you're not adding mulch. I know that right there is one of the things for me. You know, as a gardener, I'm used to putting my hands in the soil and breaking up the soil and planting my plant and then putting a nice little wrap of mulch around it. But do we need it? He wants you to, if you can't wrap your mind around not using mulch, use leaf compost rather than the wood chips. Because there are some advantages to mulch, but there's also disadvantages to mulch. You can skip irrigation because the mulch actually helps with watering. And then, you know, um, when wood decay, there when a fungi decays wood, it actually releases enzymes that are toxic to root rot pathogens. So even though the mulch could potentially promote a condition um, that keeps the plant roots wet and allows the uh, plants to rot, the mulch actually has that fungi, that wood decay fungi that will help in the long run. But this is a, you know, this is a, 
uh, you know, not a not a for sure thing. If you add mulch, then you're not going to have root rot root rot pathogens. This is just, you know, so the way mulch is interacting with the environment. And yeah, anybody knows that um, you know the way to keep some turf grass is to out of your landscape is to use mulch. But the disadvantages to to mulch is it doesn't allow you to observe the soil surface. I mean, like with the watering, how many people just go water on every Friday rather than really looking into the soil to see if it needs water. It increases stress in lightly irrigated landscapes. What I mean by lightly irrigated, and if you took master gardener training, surely you know this, that it is better to water heavily one time a week and thoroughly than to water a little bit every day of the week because the plants aren't getting enough water and they'll start becoming stressed out even though you're irrigating them. And uh, it doesn't allow the plant to grow its full life. So you're kind of like, here, here's your spot. Now don't move. Don't spread, which if we want a nice full garden, we actually want it to spread a little bit. And then it can create problems with crown rot around the plants. So addressing weeds. So most weeds are going to pop up around the plants, especially if you don't till. If you till, the weeds are going to pop up everywhere. Your overall goal really is 50 to 75 percent of weed suppression. You don't feel like you have to sit there and get every last weed out of the garden, especially if it's not a, a weed of concern. So during the first two years, you're going to get yourself a Dutch hoe. And you're going to, every two or three weeks, you're going to use this Dutch hoe on those little small seedlings. You're going to also use this Dutch hoe for your winter weeds, that chickweed and shepherd's purse um, after you mow in April that, that are going to start coming up as soon as the soil warms. Here's chickweed, here's shepherd purse. You guys, now that uh, you may not have recognized it by the name, but I'm sure you've seen this growing in the landscape somewhere. By season three, your plants are so closely knit together that the weeding is so minimal that you almost don't even need to use a, sh a shuffle hoe. They'll probably be shaded out by your perennials that are now well established and doing very well and in, in being aggressive in their own right. You edge the garden in April after you cut back and then again in July. So I thought this was a good suggestion because usually I just, um, I don't edge a lot, but if when I do edge, I just edge one time a year. But to go ahead and do that second edging to prevent the weeds from getting into the garden is a really good idea. So, um, for the next part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about three of the most unwanted weeds. He goes into a whole section of weeds, um, to, which I think is great. To know as much about your weed nemesis as the plant you're trying to grow um, makes you a better gardener, makes you understand the plant better. Um, Canada thistle. We all hate it. All horticulturists hate Canada thistle because they seed so much and those seeds can remain viable in the soil for a very long time. Uh, I, think, I, I, I think I remember hearing uh, a horticulturist from Canada saying, if you let one thistle flower, you'll have thistle for the next 10 years. Um, this is one that is not easy to weed. Um, even if you dig down really deep, those uh, roots and rhizomes can be three to six feet deep. No, plants don't normally do that. You know, those ones with the um, tap roots definitely go deep. 
but this is why it can be hard for you to dig up um, Canada thistle because you're not getting all those roots and rhizomes. It blooms June through September. And it's, you know, a Canada thistle blooming is a great way to identify it, but by then it's too late to think about um, um, treating it. You need to treat it early. You need to treat it before it bolts, when the plants are about six, six to ten inches tall, and during the bud to flowering stage. And you may have to treat multiple times. Now I say treat. I know that a lot of gardeners are anti-chemical. And I agree with you. I do not want to use chemicals if I do not have to. But for some weeds, like Canada thistle, it is better for you to control it than to let it go to seed or let it start spreading. So this is an example of where I would use a chemical treatment to get rid of Canada thistle. Otherwise, you're going to be digging out rhizomes and digging out rhizomes and digging out rhizomes. I think when it comes to invasive species, as a horticulturist, I am okay with chemical treatments because I know that not using that chemical treatment, I won't kill the plant and therefore it's altering the environment. Quack grass. Who doesn't love quack grass? And then when you try to pull it, you never <laughs> get all the roots. So you, you tend to break it up and leave those rhizomes behind. One of the ways to identify quack grass is this, this oracle that kind of clasps the stems. Again, this is one that the herbicides are most effective in spring and fall. And who doesn't love filled bindweed? Um, I think I have been fighting filled bindweed my whole entire horticulture career and uh, have experimented with multiple strategies and it is still comes back with a vengeance. Um, again, spreads by rhizomes. Notice the theme of rhizomes. Oh, drought tolerant. And this is another one where you can dig, but you're probably not going to get everything. Or, you, or, you know, for instance, I heard a story yesterday that um, we had a pond at a children's garden and they lifted up the, the, uh, the pond lining and filled bindweed was growing just fine underneath there. So this is one you really need to attack and get it out of your garden. And if you have to use chemicals, then just use them responsibly and don't spray everything. Just spray these tough pet, uh, tough um, plants. So you're fertilizing, back to the fertilizing. Again, in March and April, you're going to be mowing with a mulching blade. And you go over it several times because, you know, uh, you can never get it the first pass. I personally am using a hand push mower, so um, this did not work for me this year, but uh, I, so what I did was I just cut back the perennials and put them directly into my landscape. Like I said, the ornamental grasses are, you can't mow an ornamental grass. You're just gonna have to cut them back put the uh, grass back in the landscape. I know that's a lot of stuff to put back in the landscape, but that's the way that you are fertilizing your plants. Um, and then um, I, I, now I'm going to kind of go into some of his plant selection and the reasoning behind some of his plant selection. Um, one of the uh, things that he does is he, uh, he loves bulbs. So every one of his designs incorporates bulbs because what he likes to see is he likes you to mow and then you have all that brown stems on the ground and then he wants to see the bulbs pop up out of all the brown stuff. So one of his favorites is Chiodoxa and he loves um, uh, daffodils, of course, don't we all love daffodils? And Imagine those popping out from all the dead space and it uh, kind of looks like an alpine garden in a way. 
So adding the bulbs can cover up some of the um, cutback that you do. Um, his plant dynamics. This is one of this is a really good uh, example of why he puts certain plants together. So we calamintha, we've all grown calamintha. It's a great plant. It's kind of aggressive. It's really beautiful for a long season. Really easy to take care of. Probably should be one of those 30 plants we learn about. He plants them with allium summer beauty. And so the textures of the plants together, they grow, they grow, they cover the ground. They go the, in the in this in June, they look really pretty. But then he also plants um, Allium atropoparium, and that's the one in the middle. And it blooms in late July. And again, the uh, Calamintha is still blooming, and it looks really pretty contrasting with those two flowers. But you probably wouldn't normally want to put Allium atropoparium in the landscape because the foliage starts to look ugly. And if you don't have anything covering up that foliage, you're not going to enjoy it quite as much. But you can't even see the foliage when you plant them in these combinations with the um, Calamintha. Um, I'm going to go over two sedges. He loves sedges. And looking at his love for sedges, I can kind of understand because they make really great ground covers. They're super versatile and they really are quite beautiful in texture when mixed with everything or just sometimes he just has different uh, sedges mixed together and it really is quite stunning even without flowers. So blue sedge is the first one I'm going to talk about. It's Carex flocca. It's kind of a bluish green foliage, um, kind of moundy. You know, you guys have probably seen it in landscape, maybe one or two, but probably not um, to the uh, extent that he wants you to plant them, um, multiples. So one of the things that I loved about his book was that he talked about the spread in a time period. And I've never seen this kind of information in other horticulture uh, research. Um, usually it says plant two feet apart. Well, how long does it take for that to happen? So I, I, I thought this was great, especially for landscapers or people who want it to knit together faster. They're gonna spread 12 to 16 inches in two years. But if you leave them in there for five years, they'll spread 18 to 26 inches. So that gives you a decision. Do I want to, do I want to plant to where it knits together faster and then maybe I might have to remove a few later on? Or do I want to plant to where I don't have to remove a few but I have to worry about weed seeds a little bit more in the first parts of the uh, planting it gives you a decision. It, it, it helps you make a decision on what you want to do. So I love that information. It's a full sun to part shade. It has brown spikes. They're not as ornamental as, say, the allium that we're planting it with. And then he gives you a mix, a combination. So like if, if you want to plant blue sedge, he wants you to also plant allium summer beauty with it. And again, he... Um, plants different sedges together. He went through a whole section on sedges. I just picked out my two favorite. Now this is brome grass. Please don't get this confused for the smooth brome grass that is used as a pasture grass and is considered invasive. That grass is bromus species. This is another carex. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean it doesn't share some of the habit Obviously, this one's going to be a little bit aggressive, which makes it a wonderful ground cover. Um, just this nice, soft texture, um, light shade to full shade. This is definitely not going to be your sun one. This is going to be near trees or in your shady locations. And he mixes it with hostas. And to be perfectly honest, the bottom right corner is gorgeous, even though it's not tons of color. I just love the mix of the bold blue leaves with that 
soft, fine texture. Now this one must have moist conditions. Again, know your plant really well. You have dry shade, you're never going to pick brome grass. You have wet shade, you're probably going to say, hey, maybe brome grass is an option for me. He loves alliums. And who doesn't? I, I think it's one of the most underutilized bulbs. We should plant a lot more of them. Um, because, you know, it seems like we have... Um, you know, this burst of daffodils and tulips everywhere, and then now we're ready for the alliums, and not very many people plant them. Now, I know they're kind of expensive, but so worth it in the long run. Um, Summer Beauty is one of his favorites. This one is a sterile cultivar. It blooms June through September, um, and it has very attractive foliage, which is one of the reasons why people love this one so much. Then you had the Atropurpurium, which is the one that doesn't have attractive foliage, but blooms May through June and is dark purple into July. Um, we have uh, Caerulium, and that one is a blue one that blooms in May. We have Carinatum, and that one it's called Witch's Garlic. And it has loose flowers, and they are purple, and it blooms in May also. Then we had Christophia, and that is pictured in here. That's that big, huge one that everybody has been raving about lately. It blooms in May, has these huge, large purple orbs on these long stalks. And then we have Flavum, which is the bottom, which is called Ornamental onion. It blooms in the midsummer, has these loose yellow clusters. And then Molly. It's bright yellow, has a really long summertime in the early summer. So, incorporating a few more of these alliums into your landscape can really help with the attractiveness of the garden. Um, you know, if you looked at that top picture, just just you know a hosta but in combination with the allium it just really kind of makes it emotional and um, nostalgic in a way i love the allium christophia it kind of looks like makes me think of disney or something um, so I'm just now going to go through a few of the plants that he really liked and i'm going to emphasize another point that he made we have yellow false indigo. Oh, love indigo. Just an amazing specimen plant. Um, has, you know, this, you know, moundy habit. It's, of course, it's not one that you're going to uh, transplant because it doesn't transplant very well. Um, these spikes of bright yellow flowers in June. Again, he gives us that spread information. So you make that decision. Do you want to it to knit together faster or do you want um, and prevent yourself from weeding or do you want to um, allow it to knit together at mature size it full sun and light shade he mixes this with geranium New Hampshire purple now he likes particular cultivars and some of the cultivars that he really likes are like perennial plants of the year and stuff that he's actually used in the industry and this was really interesting to me is the ratio so at the end of geranium I put 70 percent so if you're going to do a little clump of this yellow false indigo with your geranium, you're going to plant 70% as geranium and 30% as false indigo. And then you're going to knit it together easier and faster. He also puts, you know, the uh, daffodils in there for that early, early season uh, blooms. Uh, Euphorbia polychroma, cushion spurge. I love this plant. The, I think the reason why I love it is because the yellow flowers really contrast great with the foliage. The foliage actually has its own little color when it comes out. 
Another thing is if you cut it back after bloom, it will rebloom. It's just a really, and it's so compact and pretty. Um, just a really neat looking, vibrant plant. So um, doesn't grow very tall, 12 to 14 inches. Those yellow bracts cover the plant in early May to mid June. Again, I said if you cut it back, you'll get some rebloom. And um, you're going to mix this one with salvia. And um, so it's going to be 40% salvia and 60% euphorbia. And the reason and for that, you know, if you think about how these plants act, the salvia is probably a bit more aggressive than the euphorbia. So you're going to plant less of them. Um, every good garden needs a perennial geranium. They're just prolific bloomers. They're really pretty. They're short. Um, they, you know, spread pretty well. Um, they have these early June through August blooms. I mean, you, when it comes to a perennial, you usually don't get that long of a bloom time. Um, so why, you know, have too many perennials that only bloom for a week? Why not pick perennials that bloom for six weeks? Um, this one's full sun to part shade. Again, an adaptable plant, does well in clay soils. And he mixes this one with Nepeta and that summer beauty again. So um, the Nepeta is only 40%. The geranium is 60%. Again, because the Nepeta probably is a bit more aggressive than the geranium. But that flower combination, the blue of the Nepeta, the pink of the geranium, and the dusty lilac of the allium, just really pretty color combination. Uh, salvia, um, I love salvia for so many different reasons. Um, I'm a pollinator person, so you cannot uh, have salvia blooming in the summer without having buzzing with bees and be delighted at everybody coming to visit. Um, it has um, deep green foliage. It's easy to grow. Again, it's the same as uh, the, the geranium, meaning it blooms for a really long time. Um, and, uh, you can, it'll actually do some reblooming if it peters out in the middle of the summer. It's full sun. You're going to mix that, um, with Nepeta or, um, geranium sanguineum. Uh, it's just, um, I like a perennial geranium, but it's the white one, uh, not the little pink one, which blue and white, amazing combinations. The bees will love it. Perfect colors for them. Wild quinine. Every time I see this plant in bloom, I'm like, oh, I should have planted wild quinine. It's a it's a native, so it's not as um, um, it's not as uh, available in the industry. Um, sometimes you know you can definitely go to the uh, garden center and find your echinaceas, but finding wild quinine isn't always the easiest. But if you do find it, it is a wonderful, beautiful plant that blooms later in the season. Now, when it comes to blooming later in the season, this is one of the um, one of the um, one of the things that we should do as gardeners. You know, we we know that um, pollinators have trouble early in the spring before the trees are flowering. That's why we always let our uh, violets and um, dandelions grow, but pollinators also have trouble in the fall. I know there's goldenrod blooming everywhere, but it's not enough. We have to incorporate more late season blooming flowers into our garden in order to ensure pollinator health. So if you don't feel like you have enough late season in your garden, this wild quinine could be an amazing resource for you. Again, he's mixing with 70% echinacea, which makes me know that this wild quinine can hold its own because we know echinacea can sometimes be a bully in the garden. Um, garden flocks. I, I love some garden flocks, especially the garden flocks that doesn't have powdery mildew. Um, 
This one has, you know, really pretty blue clusters early July to August. Again, that late blooming that um, provides for pollinators, full sun to light shade. He mixes this with Molinia grass. Um, so the grass is 70% and the phlox is 30%. But imagine in July and August, this blue of the flower mixed with the beautiful foliage of the Molinia. Um, this one, um, uh, phlox, no, we, I think we all know that sometimes can be susceptible to drought, especially in July and August for us. So that's why you need to really ensure those five inches during those months. Um, sweet betony, stackies, humalo. I think this was the perennial plant of the year last year. Um, and how could it not be the, I mean, look at the size of those flowers compared to the foliage and so upright, just rich. And the, again, a long season of blooms. Could you imagine, you know, a mix of that with your, um, your uh, prairie drop seed, um, just a really, really um, cool color combination, cool combination. Your prairie drop seed is probably going to be really vibrant right when this one, uh, uh, is in full bloom and then even after. Iron wheat, this is another really underutilized perennial. Um, I know it's because of availability, um, but it is wonderful, just an easy plant to grow, not very many issues. Um, it uh, has this kind of fine, narrowy foliage. Um, it's September through October. So again, another one of those late fall bloomers for the pollinators. It has short foliage and it um, spreads quite a bit after five years, but not in the first two years. There's a, a limited spread. So um, I, I um, do not know why I did not put the combination up here. But we're combine, combining that again with the prairie drop seed. Again, the prairie drop seed will be in full glory when the um, ironweed is in bloom. And just makes a, a, a nicely knit community. So I do have some resources. Of course, I had problems finding images from these particular cultivars from university websites. So I did have to go through some of the industry websites to find images. And this is where I found it. Um, you know, if you don't read the Home Garden and Pest newsletter, and uh, we have uh, 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 a weed specialist, Michelle Weesbrook, sorry, I misspelled her name. Um, um, so she writes for Home Garden and Pest Newsletter, and she gives you like, you know, she tells you like it is. This is quack grass. This is what you have to do to control it. Um, so uh, if you have any of these weeds, there are Home Garden and Pest Newsletters in there. Um, particular, if you are a, a social media person, please follow me. I have a blog called Flowers, Fruits, and Frass. And um, frass means insect poop because flowers, fruits, and insect poop just doesn't quite have the alliteration that I was looking for. However, it probably would have been just as catchy. And then I'm on Facebook for Livingston, McLean, and Woodford. And I'm on Instagram for U of I Hort Nerd. I know you're all on Instagram and you're liking me right now. So um, the Four Seasons, they put their past recordings um, up. Uh, these usually go on YouTube. So there's upcoming webinars. Here's all the information. 